We have very little time now for questions to the panel, but I think we should give it a try because I could see that a lot of people would like to add something. I will really restrict it to 10 minutes, so I'll collect three questions. I saw two ladies over here. Maybe you can pass the microphone over there. Here. Well, four wonderful presentations, but I think the one thing I missed was what is happening now in the squares, in St. Agma Square, in um, Madrid, in St. Paul's in London. Uh, what is the new, what is the role of protest movements? Because uh, what I think is that there are moments of ferment when people are engaged in all sorts of movements, and those are moments when really things change and new ideas develop. If we think about uh, the history of pro-Europeanism, I think there were two big moments. One moment was the, end of the, uh, was the end of the Second World War, and the other moment was the end of the Cold War. And actually, I think, although I think all those things that Helmut were talking about was very important, I think the role of the peace movement and the opposition movements in Eastern Europe in generating an idea of Europe was much more important. I mean, as somebody who was engaged in the peace movement, suddenly really German politics really mattered to us because we wanted to defeat cruise missiles. Suddenly we all became really knowledgeable about the politics of each other's countries. And so Europeanism became something we discussed every day. And many of us started not as Europeans. But I think something similar is happening now. You know, when the Greeks are demonstrating in St. Agma Square, actually what the Germans decide is incredibly important. And so a huge discussion is going on. And it seems to me this is a real moment when people are going to th start thinking differently and we need a debate about what role these people, what role mm. protest movements play. Just one last little point. <laughs> you know, uh, I, um, Agnes mentioned the anti-neoliberals. I mean, some of them are xenophobic, but there's a debate going on. I mean, I've been to the debate in St. Paul's. Some of them think the answer is Europe, the answer is global, and that's a really important debate for the future of Europe. Mm. Okay, I really need to collect questions now, otherwise, if you would just pass right behind you to... Mm. Hi, I'm a student from Siospo, and I'm from India, and I can draw an analogy to Europe, as India is also marked with multiculturalism, diversity, and presence of minority communities. My question is, it's perhaps a bit off track, but I'm really curious, that as we discuss disintegration and discrimination against certain minorities, what would be the implication of the current European crisis on this space, where it's possible that it's not only the minorities, but people we consider privileged in terms of education and the, the social class. And they're also forced to move to some other country for better opportunities. What do you think will be the implications of, on the European social space regarding this movement? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll answer that right away. And I take two more questions in the back. That was that blonde lady there, and then you. Thank you very much for really interesting, thought-provoking presentations. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that uh, Helmut uh, said, which was um, you put forward the suggestion that um, rather than relying on official... Sorry, stand up. Um, rather than relying on official EU programmes, that you um, would advocate civil society getting together and... Um, uh, promoting civil society engagement across borders. Um, but I'm just wondering, given um, what Chetan uh, mentioned, that there's a, a lack of a kind of interest between individual uh, citizens from different member states, um, perhaps a lack of cohesion between these different uh, citizens. Um, to what extent do you think that this, this kind of self-motivation and um, civil engagement is possible? Um, and if it is possible, is it not likely to be promoted by the same um, elites that you were talking about, this kind of strata of people who believe in the European project? Would it not be those same people promoting this um, engagement? All right, thank you very much. Last question from here, and then I will pass these interesting thoughts to the podium. Yes, thank you. Anella Bigna from Herti. My question goes mainly to Dr. Cochet and Dr. Fassin. You both used several times this notion of neoliberalism 
as an underlying cause for different kinds of discrimination. And as we are here at the Dahlendorf Symposium, I'm really wondering what exactly you mean by it. And if you could perhaps elaborate on this very ambiguous notion I'm not so comfortable with. Thank you. Okay, so now it's yours okay. to answer. <laughs> right. Um, I think I'll have a go at Mary's question. <laughs> Quite interesting. Um, it's difficult to give you a very holistic answer now, but I wonder whether there's also a danger in taking these protests without really knowing who is participating and what the claims are. Because um, I also wonder whether some of the fault lines that we've been talking about, as of the marginalizations, exclusions, are reflected in the, the, the sort of demography of who is participating in these discussions, because it's not really clear. Even if you look at um, Arab Spring, Egypt, for instance, who was on the Tahrir Square, what their claims were, is it good for you know, women's rights, women rights groups, or is it good for the gay groups? I mean, there's a sort of claim coming out of sort of bold headlines, oh, this is democracy liberalism, but we don't know who is in there and who is excluded. And if we really go only with the headlines, I think that would be my quick answer. Yeah, maybe Chaitan, just, I mean, whoever would like. Yeah, there were all of you addressed in a way, so just... Uh, can I also partly address um, Mary's question and also the one that, that, that came to the back? I think in terms of the new protest movements, um, it's tempting to see these in terms of the older movements or um, the movements of the 60s and so forth. Uh, and in the language of old social movements and political movements that, that we're used to. And um, in, in terms of the question that was asked by uh, the last question that was asked, I think the forms of civil engagement and political engagement is happening across Europe. It is happening across Europe and it's been happening across Europe in uh, forms and modalities through new media, through networks, through younger people and older people. Uh, and you've seen those forms of organisation that are um, uh, semi-organised, collective disorganised protest and so forth, and they've happened for a long time across the religious right. Um, and they've happened in, in transnational forms. You can't understand part of what happened in Egypt without thinking about the associations between young people uh, from Egypt and Serbia uh, in terms of the particular forms of uh, organisation that they uh, advocated. And I think um, it sort of links in with Hakan's point that how do we see this in terms of the old languages of uh, progressive languages of the left in terms of um, agendas and manifestos and so forth. And I don't think that's clear at the moment. I think these are very unsettled. There are so many different uh, languages of liberty uh, and so forth going on. I think some of the areas around women's rights and gay rights are just accepted as natural as part of these movements. Uh, for other parts of the movement, they're not. Uh, and it's, it's an unsettled and vibrant phenomena that I think it's very difficult to map at the moment. I don't, natu I don't inherently think it is going to be, um, we're talking about uh, an inherently progressive phenomena because there are elements of the right that have organised in this way for a long time. Yeah, I would agree with that. No, that's right. Okay, how about the question for you as well? Uh, I, I, Mary, I argue now the context of my paper, I think it, it may well be a passionate debate, but uh, who is debating? And I would put forth the proposition that the, uh, in terms of social class, in terms of educational background, that the new social movements are exactly what we all think they are. Right? They're pri primarily carried mm -hmm. by well-educated people with uh, decent jobs and decent job prospects. Uh, but that's supposed to be found out, and in fact, I look forward to our project on that very, very question. The, uh, the other, uh, the, the lady in the back, to some extent, uh, I made that point out of frustration because I, I don't think the, uh, that, that civil, we should have more of a civil society uh, response in terms of uh, bringing about uh, opportunities for volunteering and civic engagement at a European level. I think it's, it's the frustration that you, that you observe when you uh, look at uh, what the EU actually manages and it is, it is in fact very difficult for a Brussels based organisation to organise something of that scale and of that type 
which is inherently much closer to the self-organization of society than to some regulatory aspect. It has the same weaknesses that the United Nations has in organizing a meaningful volunteer program. It, and even at, at, in this country, in the German case, uh, we have the same problem. I mean, nationally organized volunteer programs never really work. And one would have to be creative on how, to, uh, how that uh, would come about. I had a sign that Eric wanted to add something to it as well. Cool. Uh, just uh, to tie together your question and, and yours, uh, and, and uh, I'm sure Angela will add to this. What, what I would say first is, I mean, I don't have any original definition of economic neoliberalism, but I think what we have witnessed, for example, in the recent crisis uh, is a case in point. I mean, what's happening with Greece, uh, the fact that, for example, the idea of reducing spendings does not in any way seem to refer to military spendings, but it seems to be much more about uh, reducing other state expenses, I think is one indication. Uh, so I'm not in any way original about this. What I think I would say, though, is that I am not arguing that neoliberalism is the cause. Oh, there's no economic determination there. And so, to your question about the crisis, it depends on political answers. So it does not follow from the crisis that people will be more xenophobic. It may be that political parties will play that card but there's no necessity. I mean, it's not uh, uh, in any way a necessity. And in particular, I mean, to make a link with your own presentation, I think it is pop possible to play on white working class resentment against Europe and to play that card. Mm. But it does not mean that the poor working class uh, people uh, in Europe, uh, when they're white, have to be xenophobic. There's no necessary link. Yeah, I just would like to continue on this line. I think there is a, or we have to distinguish between political neoliberalism and political liberalism as a theories and economic neoliberalism, which is very much um, state has to be reduced and uh, all kinds of public expenses has to be reduced and etc. And what I wanted to say probably. Um, it was not clear, or was I was not a, um, really eloquent in my paper, but um, neoliberalism as such uh, really had a profound impact on the marginalization of Roma. Like if you're gonna go to Central Eastern European countries, the public uh, uh, school system, the health system, and um, the welfare regime, and etc. I would able to, you know, um, continue the list with all these items, uh, but liberalism as such, as freedom, as rights, I'm very much for that, so I'm myself liberal as well. But what I wanted to point out, the human rights as an issue, as a discourse, is important, but it was not sufficient to address the issue of Roma. So the, 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 um, uh, the underlining points was much more on political and civil rights, and, and we, um, you know, we somehow forget about their material conditions, how they are living uh, in various spaces in European countries. So there are the two things what we have to distinguish, political liberalism and economic neoliberalism. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's as far as we can answer your questions. No, I'm, I'm sure you can discuss more during the coffee break. I would like to have Hakan the closing, have the closing words for this panel. And thank you as well then. It will work. Okay. Um, thanks very much for the, 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 the discussion, but I also thank all the panelists who sort of agree to participate in this process. Uh, it was quite important for us. And also, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, Dr. Nick Dennis and Dr. Mark Kettola, who were working with us on the research leading to our paper in particular and produced excellent background papers on a number of issues we are covering here. So uh, without their work, we couldn't have managed this, really. Thank okay. you. And Hakan and Chita, thank you as well. You get the book, the Darendorf book, oh. from the organizers, both of you. Right. Thank you very much for this panel. Thank you. Thank you.